all of our material and temporal duties, brothers and sisters, all our activities, which have as their end this present age which is passing away, appear as nothing. They have no value in comparison with the keeping of our soul and things spiritual. What will it profit a man, the Lord says, if he gain the whole world and yet loses his soul? The whole world then, standing before the soul and salvation, is as if nothing. It has no value in comparison. And basing herself in this fundamental Christian truth, today, continuing our series of homilies on the spiritual teachings of Gironsa Macrina of blessed memory, Gironsa addresses the following words to us. Just as we do not forget to eat our food in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, she says, likewise, we should be conscious of our spiritual duties. Just as we do not forget to eat our food in the morning, in, at noon, and in the evening, likewise, we should be conscious of our spiritual duties. In other words, no one in his right mind forgets his material and temporal duties. No one forgets to eat, no one forgets to shower, no one forgets to brush his teeth, no one forgets to go to work. And so Yerontasa says, no one should forget his spiritual duties, which, as the Lord has just told us, are infinitely more valuable and more important for us. And she continues, every work, every duty, whether spiritual or temporal, whether of this age, has its wage. And what is the wage, brothers and sisters, of spiritual labor? It is something inestimable. It can't be valued. Union with God by grace is the wage. The acquisition of grace of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God within us. And Gerontasa describes this for us. Just as when someone is sweetened by something and cannot bear to lose it, and he becomes a crazy person who is out of his mind. So this is exactly what happens to someone who has been sweetened, who has been visited by God, by grace. The experience, in other words, is so profound, so filling, that the person never wants to lose it. It's that important and special and great. But Yerontasa also wants us to understand that this wage, this promise of grace, is not guaranteed. It requires that we fulfill the appointed works, the appointed duties, just as we fulfill our temporal duties. And to help us understand, she uses an example from the business world. Every company, she says, has its rules, and every business has its timetable, its schedule. If someone goes to work 10 minutes late, he loses a part of his wage. Now we all know this. If we're hired for a job and we're given the hours of 9 to 5, and if we don't manage to keep those hours, if we show up late, if we show up at 10, if we show up at 11, if we show up at 12, we'll be docked a part of our wage. And this, Gerontesa argues, is roughly how the Christian life works. Christ has created the company. He has hired us. He has given us all the necessary tools in order to do our job. What remains for us to contribute is the small two coins of our work. And the extent of our work, whether we bear fruit at all, or thirtyfold, or sixtyfold, or a hundredfold in our job, will determine the extent of our wage. He who doesn't work will not be saved, and the rest will be recompensed according to their fruits. Now all of this, I think, brings us to perhaps an obvious question. What specifically are the spiritual works that we ought not to overlook and which bring us such an inestimable or invaluable reward. Here in this teaching, Yerontasa lists a few of them. And not surprising, it shouldn't be surprising to us by now, having heard all that we've heard from Yerontasa in the past weeks and months, she begins our spiritual obligations, our spiritual duties, our spiritual jobs with prayer, and specifically with the recitation of the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me all throughout the day, as often as possible, at every available moment. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. While I'm washing the dishes, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. While I'm walking from place to place, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. 
at every moment we can bear to muster it when we aren't occupied with the thoughts of this life, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. This time, however, when she speaks of the prayer, she adds a comment which we have not heard before and which speaks of the great value of this prayer. She compares the use of the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, with something else very good, spiritual conversation. She writes, At the time of our work, or whatever else we do, instead of idle talking, instead of discussing, instead of telling stories, instead even of talking spiritually, it would be better for us, she says, to say the prayer. Instead of even spiritual conversation, she says the prayer is better. Now sometimes, of course, we tire of saying the prayer. We need to change things up a little bit on account of our weakness. And so in these cases, spiritual conversation, good conversation, is useful. But it always ranks below the saying of the prayer in terms of spiritual good. And she explains why. She writes, because she says, even in a spiritual conversation, there will be a judgmental word here and there, a piece of gossip, idle talk, some murmuring, and there will be humorous comments and other such things. In contrast with this, the prayer, on the other hand, will always be pure. Spiritual conversation is something that's capable of being polluted even in the best circumstances. The saying of the prayer is always pure and beneficial. And then there are a few other spiritual duties, parts of our job that she bids us not to forget, most of which we've covered recently. She talks about the prayer rule, she talks about fasting, she talks about the attendance at church services, particularly on Sundays and the feast days, she talks about the special grace associated with feast days, she also talks about the application of the advice of our spiritual father. She reminds us here, if we plant his spiritual advices very deeply inside our heart and put them into practice, then he will easily give us more spiritual words to raise us up even higher. If we apply his words, in other words, this becomes a foundation upon which more might eventually be added. But if we don't do this, if we don't apply the small advices we've been given, what possibly can he tell us from that point onward? Sometimes I even have this question myself in my own relationship with my spiritual father. Why doesn't yet to say more, I sometimes think. And then the thought comes to me. It's because I have not yet applied precisely what he told me to do before. He can't build on the foundation I've been given because I haven't applied precisely what he previously gave me. So Yerantza encourages us again to apply the advices we've been given so that the spiritual father can help us advance in the spiritual life. But these are all things, brothers and sisters, that we've covered roughly in past weeks. But then to close, in the last of the spiritual advice or spiritual jobs she sets forth, Yerantza spe speaks of one more duty in some detail. This is the work, brothers and sisters, of self-examination and confession. Every day, she says, we ought to ask ourselves, before our prayer rule, when we get, go to bed at night, every day we ought to ask ourselves, where did we sadden God? Where did we please Him? Every day. And then we need to go to confession regularly. And she gives us an example of the voice of one who confesses truly in order to inspire us to confess properly. This is the voice of one who confesses truly. Forgive me, I am at fault. My passions, my weaknesses, my blindness, my ego, the disorder and filth in my soul separate me from God. Who has con uh, consented to enter into my heart so that I can know him? I want you to forgive me. I am at fault, with my eyes full of pride, full of malice, full of evil. I do not see my soul is blind and I continue this same behavior. Forgive me. Note that in this voice of the penitent, there are no excuses. No excuses. Listen to how accusatory of self it is. It's full of self-reproach. Who is at fault? I am at fault. I am at fault for the things that have happened. This is the voice we should imitate when we come to confession not finding blame for our sins and situations and people and so on and so forth. We should come with that accusatory tone in our mind, full of self-reproach. God, forgive me, I did this. Let us remember then, brothers and sisters, that we are all laborers in Christ, hired for the great wage of grace and union with God, and that our true work, though we easily forget it, 
is not our work at the university, it's not our work at the oil company, it's not our work at the businesses we work for, it's not homemaking. These things are all useful and important, but these will all, brothers and sisters, pass away. Our true work is the work which we do on our souls, which is eternal and which will remain unto the ages. Amen.